everybody. It's good to be here and uh, just really great to hear all of the other speakers that have, that have come already and we're just very honored to, to be among the ranks. Um, we're here to share a story with you today and like any good story, it begins with an inciting incident. It's a single event that puts into motion everything else that is to come. Now you all know this one. Boy meets girl, boy and girl fall in love, both live happily ever after. Most of us dream of living this story, and in fact, many of you might be living it right now. However, the story that we're going to share with you today is a little bit less uh, happily ever after. At least not yet. This is a story about hope. And unfortunately, the inciting incident was a devastating event. In 2010, an earthquake shook the world when the small country of Haiti was torn apart by this natural disaster. Over 220,000 people lost their lives and 300,000 more were severely injured, not to mention the extensive damage to infrastructure. Now, when all of you here saw these images for the first time, how many of you felt as if this was a situation that was truly hopeless? Yeah, so did we, and um, certainly so did they. However, we came to realize that it's in situations like these and in times like these when hope is most needed. When the earthquake hit, I was here in Williamsport. And I was here, uh, living on a small island in the Indian Ocean. At the time, neither of us had any idea how this catastrophic event would change our lives and eventually bring us together as partners in here today with you to share the story. As a music teacher, I had a spring concert to program. And when I heard about the earthquake, I decided that my choir should sing something from Haiti. And then we could collect money at the concert, donations from the audience, and be able to give that to the Red Cross. I got on YouTube, and I found a terrific arrangement of a folk song called Juan Golo. You're actually going, going to hear a performance of this song a little later this afternoon. And uh, the arrangement was done by a man named Richie Thomason. And thankfully, uh, that was in the caption underneath the video. So I got on Facebook, and I looked up Richie Thomason, and I found him. And I said, I would really, really love to perform your arrangement of this. Um, would that be OK? And he said yes, and he let us do it free of cost. It was a tremendous success. The kids loved singing the song, and it made them more interested in learning about Haiti. On top of that, we were able to raise several hundred dollars to contribute to the relief effort. Now, I, on the other hand, um, was living abroad as an ambassadorial scholar sent by Rotary International to Reunion Island. Fresh out of college and dedicated to Rotary's motto, service above self, I was eager to find every way I could to make a difference in the world. And when I got back from reunion, it just so happened that the Rotary District that sent me was raising funds to help uh, rebuild a school in Southwest Haiti that had been damaged by the earthquake. I decided to host a benefit concert to contribute to the efforts. So now, as you might have guessed, this is the part of the story when this boy meets this girl. And it started as just two old friends from middle school that were getting together to catch up. And having known about Rose's travel experience, I wanted to know what she thought about my newly found passion of helping underprivileged parts of the world by sharing their musics with American choirs. I loved it. And the more we talked about it, the more it became evident that we were going to undertake this project as well as every other project in our lives, together, as partners. Oh. <laughs> so as, as much as we would love to talk about how great it is to be married to each other, um, we're here to talk about hope and hope for other people. Last year, we founded the nonprofit organization Hope in Harmony based on the idea that the world would be a more peaceful place if we could combat the basic causes for human conflict. 
Put simply, conflict is something that happens whenever a person's basic needs are not being met. Now, this usually is the result of being in a relationship, any kind of relationship, in which one party is only interested in having their own needs met, now, and not the others. Now, we can break these needs down into physical needs, like food and safety, and affective needs, like trust and understanding. So when you think of any situation that involves conflict, chances are that one or more of these needs are not being met. So when we take the time to improve relationships and make sure that people's needs are being met, we can reduce conflict. Now we believe that music is especially well suited to achieve this goal. In addition to these general causes for human conflict, I was also responding to problems that I saw within my own profession. Over the last several decades, music education has received an incredible push to include, a, to include music from a diversity of cultures in the classroom. And while many teachers were willing and even eager to do this, few of them were really equipped with the teaching methods that would achieve anything more than just a topical or surfacey look at music from other parts of the world. Furthermore, in the realm of choral music, there have been more and more arrangements of folk songs from places like Africa and Asia and South America that are being marketed and sold to choirs in American schools. Now, because this music is considered to be um, in the public domain, publishers have the freedom to do with it as they choose. And in most cases, the profits from the music are rarely seen at the source. Now, this is not to say that public domain is inherently bad. Um, it's merely a question of free trade versus fair trade. And unfortunately, those who are most hurt by free trade are those who are fighting to have their needs met. So, here is our model. We believe in intellectual property. That said, we believe that the folk music of a culture is the intellectual property of that culture. So when we find an organization who is helping an underprivileged part of the world, helping them to basically meet their basic needs, we look for music from that part of the world. We arrange it and turn it into choral music to be sung and uh, sell it as sheet music and then take the sheet music, take the money from the sales of the sheet music and give it to the organization that is helping the people in those places. But we don't stop there. We go the extra step to educate others about the culture where the music came from. Um, now, by, by guiding American singers to develop a better understanding of other cultures and by encouraging them to develop a stronger sense of cultural, cultural identity of their own, we are able to begin to break down the walls that separate us and cause us to have fear of one another. These are walls that are built from ignorance, fear, and pride. When we succeed at breaking down these walls and enabling the disenfranchised to experience the profitability of their own intellectual property in a way that's meaningful to them, everyone involved gets a better sense of what social justice really is. It's an honor for me now to, to have my students um, sitting on either side of us right now who are going to sing for you later. And I'm just going to take a moment right now and, and publicly thank them for um, just how wonderful they are. They've had the chance to sing a lot of the music that we're talking about and uh, hopefully are good testaments to the, uh, the other interdependent human part of, of what we're discussing. And um, they're just fantastic people who... Um, uh, always, always smile and, and plow forth whenever I, I throw crazy things at them, like learning the Zulu language. Um, in terms of social justice, we have had several people who have cautioned us to avoid cultural appropriation, which is when the aspects of a culture are taken on by another culture. A lot of times this happens by a culture that has dominance over another. 
And in addition to this power relationship, it often carries with it a negative connotation because cultural appropriation has the capacity to turn aspects of a culture into a commodity. It becomes trendy because it's exotic. In this case, cultural, play, cultural appropriation could really rightfully be labeled a form of cultural theft. But this is exactly the opposite of what we aim to do. We do not wish to capitalize on the exoticness of other music. Instead, we aim to make it less exotic. We have hope that by singing and relating to these musics, people will see each other as less strange. We have hope that when people develop a stronger sense of ethnic identity, that they will value and respect the identity of others. We have hope that by just taking a moment to think about the ways in which they are privileged, people will be more willing to help those who are less privileged. We have hope that by giving to others, they will experience hope themselves. And in this new opportunity, they will start to experience their own inciting incidents. And we have hope in all of this that there will be more people living great stories like those that you and I are living in this room and have had the opportunity to live. Now, like every great story, the ones we're living now and the ones we hope to live, there's still conflict. Instead of the type of conflict, though, that destroys our confidence, leaving us paralyzed and irrevoc irrevocably hopeless. It can be the type of conflict that motivates us and challenges us to grow. When we understand the interdependence of our condition as human beings, then this is the type of conflict that causes us to pull together and act in the best interest of all involved. Togetherness. Harmony. This is something that deserves our hope. Thank you.